All right, let's turn our Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 4. And we'll be reading from verses 1 through 8. Second Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. <clears throat> I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have the ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires, and will turn away their ears from the truth, and will turn aside to myths. But you be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the course, I have kept the faith, in the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Now, what we are reading are the words of a dying man. Um, he's ready to die. He's, he knows he's going to be beheaded soon, and his time has come. And so he's going to be very, very careful about what he wants to say, because he's not going to be... Um, you know, loose or flippant, he's going to be very, very solemn. And in fact, that's how he begins uh, chapter 4, verse 1. He opens up by saying, I solemnly charge you. Now, he's used this word before, okay, in other places, but now because he's dying, uh, the solemnity of it all increases uh, many times. Um, um, the word solemn uh, in the English, it means characterized by deep sincerity, uh, but the Greek has more to do with declaration. Okay, in the English, it means just being very sincere about it, but in the Greek, the Greek word is the lexical definition, in le sorry, the lexical definition is something like this, uh, to make a solemn declaration about the truth of something, to exhort with authority in matters of extraordinary importance, frequently with reference to higher power. And that's exactly what Paul is doing. He is uh, referring to God, who is to judge the living and the dead, Jesus Christ. And, and, and it's, it's a time to fear God at this moment. So when, it, when you come to 2 Timothy 4, you cannot read this without feeling your spine tingling with, with holy anxiousness. Okay, with with uh, fear, not with not not about being frightened, but holy fear, a, a tremendous gravity of of importance as to as to what we need to do with our life. Because Paul is commanding Timothy, you are going to be judged. I might die in a few days, but you are also going to stand before God. You have yet to finish your race. You need to be you need to be sober about what I'm what I'm about to command you to do. This is a grave matter. Paul is choosing his words carefully. Even the writing material in which the letter was written was not cheap. Okay, vellum was hard to come by. It might have been written in papyri. Whatever the case, he's not going to waste his words. And it's not a question of if we die, it's when. Okay, all of us will die. It's a strange thought. We sometimes forget that we will die. You know, we automatically take for granted that our life tomorrow is in the will of God. We're, we're going to see tomorrow, right? We're going to sleep tonight and see tomorrow, and we have plans, whether it be going hiking with our friends or whether we're going to have dinner or just spending the day relaxing and, 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 and recuperating because we want to get ready for the next week, which we are expecting to happen. We need to understand we must not take the moment that we live today for granted. Tomorrow might not come. And we might stand before God because the Bible says once we die, we stand before God 
before his bima seat of judgment where he will judge as we learned last time he will judge us based on what we have done in the ministry for the kingdom of god once that end comes we, and we will face judgment the and the question is this will your heart be cleared of his conscience because when we read such words as this in verses 1 through 8 paul it's clear he has no guilty conscience he is so ready to die he's happy that it's coming there's no shame no regret okay he knows for sure he's finished the race that god has given to him and that he's run this race with the right heart so again when we read these words it, it is to be tremendously convicting and i want to say this if you're not convicted by just reading this passage then your mind is not right with god if you're not feeling at this very moment before we even go on with the rest of the message there's this fear of god this desire to repent right now and say you know what i need to get my life straightened out i need to truly live for god before Sunday communion rolls by, I'm going to repent right after the service. In fact, I'm just repenting right now. If that's not the case, your mind is not on the Word of God. It's not according to the Spirit of God. You might not even be saved. True believers will be humbled when we read such words as this. We're, we're charged, as it were, in the presence of God and of Christ, who is to judge the living and the dead. And then he talks about the millennial kingdom, the appearing of his kingdom, where we will be reigning with him for 1,000 years. So what is the right response? Even in this introduction is holy fear, even intimidation, feeling the weight of tremendous responsibility on our shoulders that one day we might actually be able to say what Paul said, I fought the good fight, I've finished the course, I've kept the faith, and in the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness. We want to be able to say, you know, such words. So, let's put ourselves in Timothy's shoes for a moment. What is he supposed to feel right now? Because Paul knows Timothy is going through difficulty. He knows how hard people can be. He's been through that especially with the Corinthian church. But he's not letting Timothy off the hook because some people in the church were giving him problems. Reading such a charge would have revealed that Timothy has greater problems to worry about than people. It's the judgment of God. And you know what? Sometimes we have to remember that the motivation to keep going is not always going to be positive motivation. What motivates us to go is this strong negative motivation called the judgment of God on the believer's life. Should we be motivated by holy fear? Absolutely. Meaning that fear of God should be so strong that it kind of, all of our problems in life sort of pales in comparison to the judgment that we have to face. You know, whatever social problems that we're going through, whatever political issues that we're upset about, this and that, all of that just becomes nothing as we consider that we are to fear the judgment of God. Turn with me again to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Oh, it's right here. Okay. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 to 15. If any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident for the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If, it, if any man's work is burnt up, he will suffer loss. There will be a moment of shame. But he himself will be saved, yet as so through fire. And we're reminded of 1 John 2.28. 
It says, now little children abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in what? In shame. The greater our faithfulness, the greater the commendation, the greater the commendation from God, the greater glory we give back to God. The more he commends you, the more he brings glory back to himself. It's really no different than a parent who's proud of his child. When their child does something great, the glory just comes right back to the parent. Despite the fact that everyone's congratulating him, even the parent might say, Good job, well done son, well done my faithful daughter. You, you end up making the, the father's heart um, joyful. But when the child does something bad, it's not just him who's ashamed. It reflects on the father's heart. Why do we want to do well? Because we desire God to be, I guess you can use the colloquial term, to be proud. The biblical terminology is to be pleased. We want to please the Lord. And some of you really don't have that inclination at all. You really don't love God. You're, you're, not, uh, you're not saved yet. That's what it is. If You don't really want to please God with all of your heart. Like if this is not making real sense, you need to repent and turn and, and call upon God to save you. And if you are a believer and you've lost this, this intensity, this, this drive toward wanting to please Him, then you need to repent because you've hardened your heart. That this is all you care about. You don't want to shrink away in shame because it will cause this grief in the eyes of God. Imagine as He looks upon you. So the greater our faithfulness, the greater the commendation, the greater glory Christ will receive through us. It goes right back to Him. It goes right back to Him. So when we strive to do good, when we strive to work the ministry of God, it's really not for our own rewards. We really don't care what we're going to get, really. Right? It's really about the glory of our Lord and Savior in Jesus Christ. All right, let's review the outline. Uh, you can break it down into two main sections. Uh, the solemnity of the ministry, verses 1 through 8, that's what we're going to right now. And the second part is his dying request, and we'll look at that after we, we are done. The specific outline, the solemnity of the ministry, or we can call it the nine nine solemn mandates for the elders and the church okay but it is primarily directed toward the leadership because it's talking to timothy but this is something all of us must do as i mentioned whatever is mandated of the pastor it it's also required of people okay um, preaching the word being ready reproving rebuking exhorting being sober enduring hardship evangelizing and what being eager should a should the pastor be the only one to do this no absolutely not everyone in the ministry should be following the example of the elders who are living like this so these are the mandates of the church and there are three reasons for that our time is limited our course is limited and there are eternal rewards that we should be a word about and we'll take a look at the second part later when we get there let's begin let's go back to verse 9 i'm sorry verse 2 uh, preach the word preach the word let's focus on the word preach for a moment there okay that's our first mandate uh preach and all the mandates here are, are also in the greek so it's very clear which what the imperatives are Now, in English, the word preach has a very negative connotation. Um, it's more like you're self-righteous and you're preaching, meaning like you're trying to get across 
you know, some persuasive reason to do what's right. And they'll say things like, you know, they'll say things like, yeah, stop preaching to me. You know, stop this. I remember going to like a carnival at one point and I was on the bungee thing that's like on your waist and the guy was pushing me up and down. I was doing all these backflips and someone, someone in the, someone in the crowd, well, our church youth group was there. They're like, Pastor Chi, you know, Pastor Chi. And then the, the guy pulling the, 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 the pulley was like, you're a preacher. He goes, ah, oh, preacher this, preacher that. He was mocking me while he was spinning me upside down. And I think he at one point got really convicted because he stopped and tried to be very delicate. Um, I should have said, your judgment is on your head for that, you know? Uh, so yeah, in the English, the word preach, it's, not, it's very negative. People have a negative connotation. Are you going to preach again? You know, preach for an hour. The Greek word clarifies exactly what this is. And I hope by the time we're done looking at this word, that you'll see that preaching is the main glory of God. Okay, it is the expression of God. The, the supremacy. The, uh, John Piper wrote a book called "The Supremacy of God in Preaching." This is how God wants to be known through preaching. The word is keruso. In this text, in this verse, is is keruksan. Uh, it's a it's a, an imperative. The word basically means this. It's a it's an official activity of a herald, of publicly announcing, publicly proclaiming, making known to the people extensively. The, um, the MacArthur New Testament commentary says this, and I quote, In the New Testament times, the herald acting as an imperial messenger would go through the streets of a city to announce special events, such as the appearing of the emperor, his duties also included public announcements of new laws or government policies and actions. Okay? It's a public declaration. Okay? Of what God has said to you or to the to the preacher. He, it's his word that you are declaring. It's not a discussion. It's not a debate. It's declaration meaning it doesn't even, it doesn't even matter what they feel about what you're going to say you are to simply proclaim it um, out loud it doesn't depend on the audience it doesn't depend on the type of listening or even the amount of people you can have one person that you're preaching to and what you need to understand is this when paul gives timothy this command Okay, now this is the content, obviously, of what he's going to teach. But notice, when he says preach, okay, when he gives that command, that means this is the very task of an elder. Okay? It's not even teaching. Anybody can teach. Preaching is on a whole new level. Okay? Preaching is the task. Okay? The task task this is what distinguishes an elder from a deacon he is called to open his mouth and declare the word of god okay. and preaching has always been the manner in which god speaks this is the way god has always spoken throughout history for instance if you go to like second um um Second Peter chapter two, okay. The text calls Noah a preacher of righteousness, okay, and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the Ungali. We believe that the 120 years is not so much the limit of mankind, but it took 120 years to build that ark. And all that time, Noah was preaching repentance. And all that time, no one responded. It was God speaking through Noah to a, a, to a world that hated him. So preaching is the manner in which God speaks. Even more than personal Bible study. Okay, we, we promote personal Bible study. We promote personal and individual study of the text. But this, this is the very means by which God saves. 
Okay, preaching is the very means by which God de declares His word, brings conviction upon the people, moves people to do what is right. Samuel was a preacher. Moses was a preacher, right? God told Moses, tell Pharaoh, tell my people, do this, do that. Jeremiah was a preacher. E Ezekiel was a preacher. Prophets are simply preachers. That's what it means. You declare the word of God. We have to get rid of this idea that a prophet is someone who can just, you know, tell the future. No, he's a, he's a declarer, a preacher of God's righteousness. They would always end by saying, thus saith the Lord. And that is what a New Testament preacher is also to be in terms of his imitation. And notice Paul, as he's dying, tells Timothy, preach the word. You're doing nothing different than the Old Testament saints. That's what he's saying. You're doing nothing different. This is exactly what you're supposed to be doing. Stop worrying about the people. Stop complaining about how difficult they are to you. You're not there to discuss. You are placed there by the Spirit of God to preach. So get up to the pulpit and start preaching. What is the content of that preaching? It's the Word of God. Okay? Pastors are not to preach their own ideas, their own philosophy, their own reasonings, the world's ideas, popular themes, whatever they think is helpful to the people. See, the office of a preacher is, is, is different than a public speaker. Now, while preachers should learn how to speak publicly, and there are some good techniques that we have to learn, you know, um, but public speaking is not preaching. Preaching is not really public speaking. Maybe you can say pub preacher being a, being a preacher requires that it to be a public thing, but it's different. The speaker for a public speaker, um, he decides what he thinks is best. But the preacher is not concerned about what people would like or what would help them. It's not even that, it's, that's not even an issue. He, all that the preacher is concerned about is what God has said, not what people need to hear. In fact, sometimes what they need to hear might be different than what God wants to say. And obviously in that sense, they need to hear that. But they might not think that this is something they really need at that moment, but God has declared through that sovereign and providential timing of the message, that this is exactly what that local church must hear for that week. See, this is why I truly believe that every ministry okay, has its perfect timing from God in terms of what He wants them to hear. It's, it, you know, it's good to listen to other uh, sermons from other pastors, and you'll learn a lot, yes, if we're, from good preachers. But that sermon from that local ministry that you are part of, that's the message the Lord wants you to hear for that week. The good pastor knows that God's word will always be beneficial to those who are listening. Christ, who is the Lord and the head of the church, desires one thing. He desires his words to be proclaimed. And so the church must focus on one thing and one thing only, his words. Okay? We gather together eagerly seeking his words. The elders are concerned with teaching his words. The people are concerned with applying the words that they're taught. Everyone in the church is somehow involved in making the word of God central to worship service. Meaning, worshiping God is making everything about, about the gathering of the people to resolve one thing. Resolve to submit under the preaching of God's word. Everything about the life of the church revolves around that. Singing. We only want to sing songs that instruct us about the word of God theologically. 
reading the scriptures, which is very, which is the very word of God. Exposition is the method by which we learn the word of God. And when we hear the word of God, we eagerly go forth in obeying and implementing what we've been taught. Why? Well, verse 3 says, Time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desire. There will be a movement away from God's word from the churches in America and all around the world, but we must stay faithful to his word. Now, just as a side note, the, the most purest form of preaching, okay, Meaning, what is a what is a what is the purest form of preaching? What what type of preaching is the preaching style? What should it be? Well, the most the purest form of preaching, I would say, is exposition. Okay, explaining the text. Okay? Preaching does indicate that we. You know, try to push the message on you forcefully, you know, with gentleness, but with great, great, um, you know, enthusiasm. Like you're not going to hear a preacher just dry and just reading off the, you know, the text. But that preaching must have exposition. Okay. MacArthur says this, by far the most reliable and effective way to proclaim all of God's word is to preach it expositorily. And he quotes um, this uh, 19th century Scotsman, William Taylor, and he says this, By expository preaching, I mean that method of pulpit discourse, which consists in the consecutive interpretation, practical enforcement of a book of the sacred canon. Exposition is the presentation to the people in an intelligible and forcible manner of the meaning of the sacred writer. It is the honest answer which, which the preacher gives, after faithful study to these questions, what is the mind of the Holy Spirit in this passage? And what is its bearing on related Christian truth or on the life and conversation of the Christian himself? End quote. That's perfect. That's a perfect definition of what exposition is. It is to understand the mind of the Holy Spirit through understanding the mind and the meaning of the sacred writer but presented in a very forcible manner. Okay. MacArthur lists, uh, I don't know if I listed it here. Uh, I think I did, yeah. Seven reasons why exposition must be the way. Okay, so when Paul says to Timothy, preach the word, he's basically saying, teach them exactly what I told you and I wrote about. Preach the very chapter that you're reading. Seven reasons why exposition must be the right way. Exposition lets God's uh, lets God lets lets God speak rather than man. Okay, when you're busy explaining the text, you have no time to really talk about yourself. Number two, exposition brings the preacher into direct contact with the mind of the Holy Spirit, the author of the Scripture. Now, this is what pastors go through. This is the most exciting moment of study. And this should be what you're after. If we talk about, you know, subjective experience as we study the Word of God, this is it. When you're studying the text, you're, you're hashing through all the details, and it's a little bit dry because you have to read a lot of the explanation and commentaries, and you have to figure out what's going on. And then suddenly, the light turns on. Everything gets bright. And you're like, whoa, this is what it means. And suddenly all of these applications just start rolling off your, off your mind. And you're like, it applies here, it applies there. And you get so excited and then you teach it and everyone will say, yes, that spoke to me. Because you've been in direct contact with the mind of the Holy Spirit. But it takes hours and hours. The Holy Spirit only blesses those who work hard at studying. Guys, your WBSA outlines, you should be working hard at that. 
You should at least be trying to do it two or three times, reading notes and commentaries. The harder you work at exp um, expositing the text or explain, um, interpreting the text, the greater the blessing the Holy Spirit will give you. So exposition, because you're dealing with the text, you're dealing with the intent of the author, you're trying to bring out what the Holy Spirit intended to the author, it's you're in direct contact, you're engaging with the Holy Spirit. That's why studying the scripture, the study aspect, is the wrestling with the Holy Spirit during that time. Exposition number three forces the preacher, okay, it forces the preacher to proclaim all God's revelation, including the difficult passages. We can't skip over a, ver a verse. Everyone will say, like, what's going on? You know? Well, why'd you skip over that word? We want to know exactly what that word means. Number four, exposition promotes biblical literacy, and this is key. Okay? It makes you look at other texts to interpret scripture with what? With scripture. Exposition carries with it the ultimate authority. I am not a, I have no authority on my own, but once I understand the text and I declare it to you, it's being done with the word, the authority of the word. And exposition transforms both the preacher and the congregation. And exposition is commanded, as Paul says, preach the word. So that's what he means. Preach the word. Exposit the word. Declare the meaning of the text in a very, very convincing, forcible, and even creative manner. But with solemnity. Okay? Not lighthearted, not as a joke, but with seriousness. And that's why there is a distinctive difference between a deacon and an elder. While both men are spiritually qualified and they are absolutely godly the task of an elder is a preacher that's his main task 90 percent of his efforts is to be used in preparing for that preaching event and all of you should be praying for that preaching does, does that make sense you are eager to hear a good message Guys, you never want to go through a weekend with a boring sermon. Like, if I was on your end, I would be praying earnestly for whoever is preaching because I don't want to go to church and hear something boring. I want to hear the voice of God declared and made so crystal clear that I know what I have to do. Okay? I don't want a blurry sermon. I don't want an overly long sermon. I mean, it can be long as long as it's clear. You know what I'm saying? Right? That's what we want. And so we're praying for that. See, it pleases the Spirit when the church is on their knees asking the Spirit, give us, uh, give us the preaching. Right? Give us the word. You know, pr we pray for that elder. Give us the preaching for Friday and for Sunday. Give it to us. And then the Holy Spirit will be pleased and it will bless that, the study. And now you'll have, you'll have the will of God being fulfilled in the church. That, that's what a church is supposed to be doing, really. So a deacon, he's to live out the preaching, and the elders do the preaching. Okay? All right, let's move on. So first mandate, preach the word. Second, be ready. Okay? Uh, be ready. Now, we're going to combine that with all of these. Be ready. And readiness goes this way as well as as well as you know all of these. Okay, he's saying be ready. The word ready uh, in the Greek, um, epithemi, epistathi, uh, has an idea of suddenness. The focus is on being available. Okay, remember uh, we said you need to be a flat Christian, F W A T, faithful, wholehearted, available, and teachable. Here it is. This is it's biblical. Okay, uh, you need to be available. You need to be ready. Okay, uh, the, the idea is there's an urgency. Okay, a readiness. Uh, it could be used of a soldier who's ready to go into battle on a moment's notice, or a guard who keeps continual, continually alert for any threat of infiltration or attack by the enemy. And he includes this phrase in season and out of season. Now, the Greek is very interesting. Look at this. Okay. 
it, it sounds like the English, right? In season, out of season. Eukairos, akairos. You see that? Um, kairos is the word for time. Okay, A is the alpha privative. Not time with time or opportune time and not opportune time. Okay, in season and out of season. Okay, it means here an opportune time, well time, suitable, like the right time. Akairos means inopportunely, inopportunely, uh, apparently in reference to situations that do not seem filled with promise to the speaker. Like he's kind of like he's a sore thumb in the crowd, like you didn't really have to say that and you said it. Untimely, unsuitable, ill time, inconvenient. You guys understand? Some of you are like, when should I speak? When should I bring out the gospel? When's the most opportune time? But the Bible says in season and what? Out of season. There might not be a good time. That time might be the only time you have to speak up and give the word of God. So you're not looking for the best and most opportune time. Paul says, be ready to speak in season and what? Out of season. It basically means when it's convenient and when it's not what? Convenient. Baker New Testament commentary says this, be on hand in season and out of season. Welcome or not welcome. Timothy must be on the spot with the message of God. He must buy up the opportunity. I remember at one time, um, you know, when we planted the ministry a while back, I heard that we all heard that someone got into an accident. I think it was Timothy, Doug. He was in the hospital. And actually, I forget who it was, but we said, let's go. Let's take the church there. <laughs> so we all went to the hospital and barged ourselves in to the visiting room. And we greeted them and said, hey, we know you're not going to be at church. So we brought the church to you. We're going to, so I just started to preach. And I remember just, feeling kind of uncomfortable and realized maybe I should have done this you know was it maybe it wasn't the right time now I look back it was okay it was out of season and it was the right thing <clears throat> will I do that again maybe <laughs> you know but the point is this as MacArthur says and I quote the faithful preacher must be ready in season and out of season when it is convenient and when it is not and get this, when it is immediately satisfying and when it is not, when from a human perspective it seems suitable and when it does not. His proclaiming God's word must not be dictated by popular culture and propriety or by tradition, by esteem in the community or even in the church, but solely by the mandate of the word. I mean, mandate of the Lord. All of us, not just the pastor. Okay. Now to Timothy, Paul had to rebuke him. I guess Timothy was like, when is it going to be the right time where everybody listens? And Paul is telling him, you're not going to have that right time. Start preaching. Get back there. Right. Do the ministry. Fulfill the ministry. And so for some of us, you're asking the question. You're asking the wrong question. When is the perfect time? Well, the Bible answers that. There is no perfect time. There might be time when the whole family says, preach to us. Yeah, right. No family would ever say that to you. They most likely will say, don't say anything. And so you try to sneak it in. Because you want them to hear the word of God. Be ready in season and out of season. But also be ready to do this. And I've included, this is mandate three, four, and five. Reprove, rebuke, exhort. This, this is, okay, negative, negative, positive. Now, think about that. Two out of three, right? Two words out of three, they're both negative, and you got one positive. This is the ministry of a pastor, okay? My job is to reprove you, to rebuke you, and also to exhort you. MacArthur mentions John the Baptist. His opening words is what? Repent. 
It's a rebuke to Israel. Jesus opened up his first sermon in Matthew 4, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at what? Is at hand. There's no real positive message from God. And everyone says God is positive. He's all love. Yeah, there's that aspect because there's a negative side to it, right? You're going to perish. You're going to, you're going to die in your sin. You must repent. Basically, the ministry, okay? If I say, what is the job of a pastor? What is, what is ministry, okay? Ministry is two, three things. Um, reprove, rebuke, and exhort. And I guess for exhort, you can word, write the word encourage. Uh, parallel as you will see okay that that this is this is this is what you're going to expect okay this is a biblical ministry where a pastor does this you know i was kind of joking around with our calculus class you know with bean trying to make her feel proud that she, she has a pastor at church where you know he knows how to cut hair for a young gen he can hang with basketball at age 45 with youngins and sometimes people love their celebrity pastors because they do all the things they, the people do. They game with them. They play with them. But a biblical pastor is not known for those things. He's known because he meets people because he's got to reprove them. He has to rebuke them. And it's not pleasant. But there will also be an encouragement. He has to exhort them. What, what's reproof? Okay, what's reproof? It means to expose, to convict. The idea here, according to MacArthur, is affecting the mind. With helping a person understand what he believes or is doing is wrong. The pastor's job is to show you, you are wrong. The reason why we have truth is because we are living in error. He's there to tell you, you need to get your life fixed. And that's what Paul is telling Timothy. Your job as a pastor is, a, is one that's corrective. But to correct someone, you have to expose their thinking. So when he says, hey, let's meet up, you're like, reprove? <laughs> Am I going to get rebuked? Not always, but yeah, there will be something he's going to bring up. So you should be ready with a gracious heart of receiving that. Okay. So we're going to call this, so there's the preaching ministry, which is on the pulpit. And then there's the one-to-one -one ministry where he needs to now expose. So we'll call this exposure ministry. What's rebuke? Now this is a little bit stronger. Um... I mean, the English word rebuke is strong too. It's just kind of confronting them and putting them on the spot. It's um, strictly appraise someone because there's something wrong to assess a penalty, a charge, okay? As being blamable, okay? Wrong, they're wrong, they're uh, warned. I mean, they warn them, they strongly admonish. And even this word there, threaten. And it's not like a personal threat, obviously, but the threat is something like this. Hey, if you don't repent, God's going to judge you. Here's a verse that says that. If you don't repent, we have to do church discipline. That's a threat. You understand? It's not like a personal threat. Like, I'm going to like, you know, no, nothing like that. But it, you have to rebuke them and say, hey, if you don't stop sinning, okay, if you don't stop thinking like that. Now, there are some people who say things like, well, show me a Bible verse and then I will change. But you need to understand that kind of an attitude is obviously off the wall because there are verses that imply things. And you need to understand, like, for instance, you know, um, be innocent of evil, right? Uh, like children. But in, in with regards to um, 
um, uh, evil be like babes, right? But in but in truth, be mature and think wisely. And Paul is using that as a as a form of a general form of saying you need to learn how to think in a most mature manner. And maybe some certain particular things that you're doing is not very mature, whatever it might be. And the pastor is going to say, hey, let's talk about this thing. Yeah, the Bible doesn't say that thing is sin or doing that is sin. But the way you're thinking, the way you're living your life, I don't think it's right. Listen to me. I have some, I, I think what you're doing is not right. And so you have to be open to that correction. Unless you, you feel like you, you really have to be threatened about that. Okay. But the idea is there's going to be a reproving. Some have to be rebuked because they're so stubborn. So I'll, I would encourage you, don't, don't make the pastor feel like he needs to rebuke you. You know, be thankful, be open, quickly receive counsel. Because it's always going to be done out of love. And so we turn to the third one, and that's the positive one, which is to... Um, Oh, I'm sorry. Let me show you the difference between the, the two first. Okay. Rebuke uh, may have to do with the heart, with bringing conviction, uh, with bringing a person under the conviction of sin. To reprove is to refute error. Okay. Trying to convince that person that their thinking and their conduct might be wrong with careful biblical argument. To rebuke is to bring the person uh, to repentance. Okay. Like, you better do this or else, you know, this is going to happen. But again, what else can the church do other than bring you to church discipline, which ultimately just means that if you don't repent, uh, we have to re regard you as a stranger to the ministry, not as one of us. The first discloses the sinfulness of sin, that's reproved, whereas the second discloses the sinfulness of the sinner. So this is a pretty good way to understand the difference. But the fifth uh, imperative uh, the positive aspect, the pastor is not only to go around, you know, reproving and rebuking. Some people do that. He goes around also to encourage. Uh, this word in the Greek is so beautiful. Uh, para means alongside. Okay. Kaleo, uh, it's from uh, the Greek word to call. So it's to call alongside of you. And it's not a call of like harshness. It's, hey, come next to me and let's walk this together. There's an encouragement there from the pastor where he's appealing to you, imploring and encouraging. And by the way, these three things, if you think about it, it's exactly what a parent does to their child. You want child raising principles? It's no different than being a good pastor of a church. You reprove your kids. Sometimes you have to rebuke them, right? But you don't. You never must forget that you also have to be positive with them and encourage them side by side, not top down, but side by side. MacArthur says this: After having reproved and rebuked disobedient believers under his care, the faithful preacher is then to come alongside them in love and encourage them to spiritual change. The Baker New Testament commentary says this, admonish or percaleo, nevertheless, the demands of love must be fully satisfied. Hand in hand with pertinent rebuke, there must be tender fatherly admonition. And there's a great passage that indicates this. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 11 through 12, it says here, As just as you know, we were exhorting and encouraging, imploring each one of you as a father would his own children, that you would walk in a manner worthy of the, worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. You know, some of us who haven't had fathers or mothers that were like this, this may be kind of foreign, I guess. But this is what a father does. And again, think about it. This is a picture of a pastor of the church, Paul, to the people in Thessalonica. This is basically a picture of parenting. There are times to rebuke. There are times to reprove your child. 
but you must also em embrace them, um, not commanding them, but imploring with them, you know, encouraging them to walk faithfully uh, in Christ. And if that wasn't positive enough, um, Paul also says this. Um, where's, where did the verse go? Okay. Well, maybe I left it. He ends the verse by saying, with great patience. Now, the English says with great patience. Um, the Greek word uh, means all kinds. Okay. Um, so when I read the word great, I was expecting the Greek word to be mega. But when you read the Greek, it has the word pasa, which means all kinds. And what Paul is saying is deal with the people in the church with all kinds of patience, all aspects of patience. Okay, For this person, you need to be patient this way. For that person, you need to be patient that way. So we don't want to and we don't want to imply that majority of the thinking that the church the pastor does is just go around and rebuke people. No, that comes when there's sin, yes. So what do you do when there's no sin? You go around with great patience, waiting for them to grow and change. And when the time comes for you to speak up, you speak up. That again is very similar to child raising, because if you keep nagging at your child to do what's right, they'll lose heart, right? So in the same way as we deal with one another in the church, we're to be patient okay, with all kinds or with different ways of being patient, long-suffering. This is a Christian virtue. But notice, with great patience and instruction. And this is key. We don't just sit back and wait. Okay? We instruct in the meantime. Okay? After we reprove, rebuke, we expose to them what they've done wrong, we don't just sit back and just wait. We continually give them instruction from the Word of God with patience, trusting that the power of God will transform them in His own time. And so we close with verse 4. Time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. This is so sad. Time will come. Um, with the word time, Paul is not talking about chronology, uh, but he's talking about a period or an epoch, an era. There will be moments in time when people who call themselves believers will begin to show that they no longer want to hear the word of God. Now, when Paul says they, okay, when they will not endure sound doctrine, he's talking about those who are unconverted. Okay? Meaning, they're professing believers. They attend church. They're churchgoers. So on the outside, they look like a Christian. They speak like a Christian. They say they believe. Okay? But they're unconverted. And Paul is saying, give it some time, and they will eventually come out. Okay, this group in the church will come out and they will clearly tell you that they don't want to deal with this exposition and preaching anymore. Notice the phrase, will not endure. And this is really, really clear. Will not endure. Okay. Uh, the word endure, uh, aneko in the Greek, means like exercising self-restraint, uh, enduring patiently um, to put up with. It, it's sort of negative, right? Like, like, you know, like you hear a screeching sound in the background. You're like, okay, I'm just going to endure for a little bit. And afterwards, you just lose patience. Ah, I forget. It. I can't deal with this anymore. And so you either want to shut the door, shut the window, or just or leave. They, know, they can't endure it. So initially... Everyone's going to be sitting there listening. Some of these unbelievers who say they're believers will say, that was a great message. But time will come, a certain moment in time will come when they will start rising up. They will no longer tolerate. They will no longer endure. They won't put up with this anymore. If they're the minority of the church, they'll eventually leave. If they're the majority of the church, they will kick the pastor out. 
And this has happened all throughout history, over and over and over again. Okay? They will no longer tolerate it. And it says right here, and he, says, he said this in 1 Timothy, if anyone advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ, and with the doctrine conforming to godliness, he is conceited. He understands nothing. He has a morbid interest in controversial questions, disputes about words, out of which arise envy, strife, abusive language, evil suspicions, constant friction be between men of depraved mind. Okay, that's an indication that they're not saved, deprived of the truth. So these are people in the church who seem to be believers. They initially seem to welcome the word of God, but give it some time, they will eventually no longer be able to tolerate it because of their conceit. They understand nothing. The Holy Spirit is not in them. And what's crazy is this. They don't just leave. If they're really, um, they, will, they will look for, um, they will look for teachers. It says they will have their ears what? Wanting to have the ears tickled, they will accumulate. For themselves. See, this is where we have to realize that human effort at trying to convert someone at times can feel so like impossible because these people who are not listening to good word, we would think when they hear it, they should react the way we did, like with joy, with great, you know, with hunger and thirst for that truth. Here, they hear truth, they won't be able to bear it. Rather than just going astray and, you know, let's say, sinning, they will sin in a different way. They will accumulate for themselves speakers who will tickle their ear. They will actually go to other churches or other speakers who will say what they want to hear. So they're not going to really listen to you at all. Isn't that interesting? No matter how much you can try to convince them that they're wrong, they're not going to listen because they're unable to respond in the right way. Uh, Jeremiah said this, An appalling and horrible thing has happened in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely. The priests rule, on, rule on their own authority. And my people love it so. So this is why preaching the truth is so important. If the majority of the church loves the preaching of God's word, then those minority will eventually what? Leave. And in one sense, it will purify the church. And it's good that they do leave. As much as we want them to stay, if they don't love the word of God as we love the word of God, they can't stay. Why? Because we worship God in that manner. They cannot worship God in the same way, in the same manner. So in the meanwhile, pray for them. Pray for those who are yet to show fruits of salvation. Pray that they will show that one clear indication, the hunger for God's word. Let's bow our heads as we close and we'll pick it up next week. Father, we thank you so much for your precious word. We thank you so much for helping us to understand uh, what to expect in the ministry. We also thank you, Lord, for making it clear of what you're requiring us to do. That we don't have to, you know, make up things and try to be creative. Father, we realize that it's so clear when we study the Word of God what the actual commands are. And we humbly pray for your wisdom, that we might do that which you have called us to do. Father, we eagerly pray for Sunday message, that you might speak to us there too. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.